Okay, so we have a, f a famous guest. In fact, we have in uh, our midst, we have uh, a European pioneer in uh, robotics, uh, Professor Rolf uh, Pfeiffer. We are very happy to have him here. Uh, the the uh, AI Institute of this university exists for 20 years, so Studium General was so friendly to give us uh, a number of slots of, uh, of lectures. And um, the lecture of Rolf is really uh, is very exciting, so we're really very happy about this. Rolf uh, received his master's degree in physics and mathematics uh, and his PhD in uh, computer science in the Swiss Federal, Federal Institute of uh, Technology in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie Mellon University, at Yale University, and since 1987 he was a professor of computer science in the University of Zurich and director of the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory there. He worked as a fellow at the Free University of Brussels at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, the Neuroscience Institute in San Diego, the Beijing Open Laboratory for Cognitive Science, the Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris, also very famous, and he was elected 21st Century Center of Excellence Professor in Information Science and Technology at the University of Tokyo. So we really have a very special guest. Now let me briefly tell something about um, the topic. And Professor Pfeiffer represents uh, an important school of thinking within artificial intelligence. At the end of the 80s and in the beginning of the 90s, within AI, it was already quite clear that computer chess was not the real challenge. Rodney Brooke came out with a famous paper uh, titled Elephants don't play chess. And the implication of that paper was, but they do a whole lot of other interesting things. Fantastic things that even today machines cannot do. Our speaker of today has always been a very strong proponent of biologically inspired systems and the rootedness of intelligence in embodied real systems. You can find traces of his work all over internet, in literature, of course, but also TEDx, lectures and numerous YouTube videos of the speaker himself or one of the robots. So, we are extremely happy that you are here. So, let's give the floor to Professor Rolf Pfeiffer. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And maybe this is a bit too loud, huh? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and to have the opportunity to talk a bit about our research. Is this, is this good in terms of, yeah, okay. About our research, which in recent years has been mostly about this area of soft robotics. Now, I'm not only going to talk about our own work, but I'm going to include what the community at large has been doing. And so here are just a few individuals that have shaped our research program. So thanks to these individuals for their ideas. Okay, so here's just a table of contents. Let me just start with a bit of background. So what do we mean by soft robotics? First, the hypothesis that I would like to put forward is that the next generation of robots will be of the soft kind. And advances in soft technology, and I will say more later what that means, will lead to a quantum leap in intelligent robotics. And the theoretical underpinnings, uh, the key to understanding soft robotics is understanding of embodiment. And I will say more what we mean by the term embodiment. So soft robotics, <clears throat> very roughly speaking, is literally on the left, literally soft to touch. <laughs> In fact, if you look at human beings, human beings are 85% made of soft materials. There is the skeleton, but that's only 15% of the body weight. All the rest is soft stuff, the muscles, the inner organs, the tissues, the ligaments, whatever, what have you. Also, what's important is soft movements, soft natural kinds of movements, and soft interaction. Now, the robots started to leave about 15 years ago. The robots started to leave the factory floors and moved into our own environment. And if they have to interact with us, the interaction has to be safe, it has to be soft, and it has to be 
uh, <coughs> comfortable. And here is an example of some soft robots that were developed at the University of Osaka that are like very much slightly freaky, freaky touch to them. Okay, now uh, a few words about artificial intelligence. So there are basically, as probably most of you know, two views on intelligence, there are many, but basically two, a classical one which is cognition or intelligence as computation, and the other one is more like a more recent one that we have been working on, cognition from movement, sensory motor, and the interaction processes. Now the first one, the computational view, can be traced back, I was warned by the way that there are philosophers in the audience, so I have to, <laughs> have to be very careful what I, of what I say. So I think this can be traced back to, to a Descartes, we all know the quote, I think therefore I am. And what he is basically proposing is a separation between the mind and the body. And also, it goes along with the idea that intelligence is something which is centralized up here in the brain. And I will try to demonstrate that this view is uh, unacceptable for intelligent systems. Also, I will show that it's not sensible, it doesn't make sense to think of a separation between the mind and body. They are very tightly intertwined. I'll give you many examples of that. Okay, now if we look at the successes of the classical view, the computational view, that is intelligence cognition as a computer program, we have enormous successes. It's been enormously successful, it's actually changed our lives, it's changed society, it's changed the world. Take search engines, you know, Google. Then chess, you know, which was mentioned before, I think that was, even though, you know, maybe that's not the main thing about intelligence, it was a landmark uh, victory. And then big data today, you can't give a talk anymore without mentioning big data. Uh, and manufacturing. I think these are real successes of this classical approach where it has not been so successful is where more natural forms of intelligence are concerned and interaction with the real world. So mostly on the left you have controlled and artificial worlds and the real worlds are actually much, much different. So what's the problem? I think it's an inappropriate view of human intelligence in terms of <clears throat> you know, this computer metaphor, basically input, processing, output. You know, it's very compelling, but it's about as wrong as it is compelling. And I will try to show that. It's a neglect uh, uh, about the um, interaction, neglect of the interaction with the real world. And what can we do about it? And, you know, maybe this idea of embodiment can be helpful. Okay, so let's look at that. Cognition from movement, sensory motor, and interaction processes. Now, if you look at that, you know, before we were doing things like chess, abstract problem solving, I don't know what. And now we're just doing sensory motor stuff, movement. What does that have to do with intelligence or cognition? Aren't we doing now just something completely different? Now, I will try to show that the two are actually tightly intertwined and that you can't think about cognition without thinking about sensory motor processes. There is, by the way, a very nice quote by a British biologist, and he asked the question, why do plants not have brains? I don't know whether you ever thought about this question. Why do plants not have brains? And then he says, well, the answer is actually quite simple. They don't have to move. So in this view, the evolutionary selectionist pressure on the development of the brain, the nervous system, has come from the need to move, to interact with the real world, to, to locomote in the real world, and to orient in, uh, in the real world. I think that's a very interesting perspective, and what's also, if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, and I mean, it's clear that what we now call intelligence or cognition has always evolved as part of a complete organism. You know, there's no f such thing. So basically, it's always a complete organism that has to interact and survive in the real world, right? It's, there's not something like an algorithmic ether out there in which we can run programs, but we also have, always have a physical system and the brain is part of this physical system of this complete organism. 
<clears throat> I also think that intelligence is not something that we should attribute to brains, but to organisms. Okay, now what do we do in artificial intelligence? We build robots, or that's one branch of artificial intelligence, in order to understand intelligence. I think it's an excellent tool. And second, of course, we want to develop useful applications. And I will be saying uh, many things about both. Now, because we uh, well, were interested in robots, we have been building robots for many years, of course, because we're interested in embodiment, you know, the role of the body in intelligent behavior. So we've been building many of these robots over the years. And these were specifically to explore morphologies, but also prosthetics and, and so on. And this is a recent development that I will say more about later. Okay, now some of these principles of uh, embodied intelligence. Now, in order to get into the spirit of embodiment, I have a couple of examples for you. So, who knows Lego Mindstorms? Who, Lego Mindstorms, is that? Ah, quite a few. Huh? So, basically, I think everybody knows Lego. And then, in Lego Mindstorms, you have a programmable brick. You can attach sensors, you can attach motors, you can program these things. And then you can do very nice, you can build very nice creatures. I have a few of, of them for you. And whenever you observe the behavior of a system, be it a biological system or an artificial system, like a robot, then there is always the question, um, what is the mechanism that brings about the behavior? What is the control underlying the particular behavior? Okay, so now keep that in mind when you see, when you watch these examples. So the first one, uh, the sound is not working. Can we do something about the sound? So the first one I like very much, we call him Crazy Bird. And I have some others. It's on here, in the computer it's on. Yeah, I know, but it's pretty close. Ah, okay, I think now it's okay. So I got another one here. Ah, now it's okay, okay. <clears throat> now the question, what is the control that's underlying the behavior? of uh, these robots, and it turns out that the control for all three of these, I mean, they were doing very different things, right? They were behaving very differently, but the control for all of them is exactly the same. It's identical. It's what you see in the lower right corner. So it's basically just the wheels turning at a constant speed. And that's it. That's the same for all three. Now, if you think about Crazy Bird, Crazy Bird was not doing only one thing, but different things. But the control was only, you know, these wheels turning at a constant speed. How is that possible? Well, if you look at it, so uh, <clears throat> this is Crazy Bird, and the way it works, it has here sort of loosely hanging feet. So basically, it does something like this, right? And on the foot, on the one side of the foot, there is a rubber piece, and on the other side of the foot, there is plastic. And so if it does this, and by chance, on one side, the rubber piece happens to be on the ground, and on the other, the plastic, because of the difference in friction, it will spin around its own axis. So you've got this random component, and then if you understand the materials and the morphology of the system, you can understand the behavior and why it's doing different things, even though the control is always doing the same thing, right? Now, what's important here is that the behavior of Crazy Bird cannot be inferred from by just looking at the program. Right? If you look at the control program, you just see the wheels turning at a constant speed. You don't see this you know, flexible behavior. You have to understand how the control is embedded into the physical system. You have to understand the morphology, that is the shape, and you have to understand the material properties of the system. You have to know that there is this rubber piece and the plastic. Only then can you understand why it behaves in, in this particular way. Now, the message for brain science is... The message for brain science is... If you only look at the brain, and you identify some... Are there any neuroscientists here? No? Uh, some. <laughs> okay, if you only look at the brain 
and you identify, let's say, some neural circuits, you have no way of knowing what these neural circuits mean for the behavior of the organism unless you know how the brain is embedded into the entire organism and what the properties of the organism are of the sensory and the motor systems. Right. And so this, I mean, this is just a summary. Studying the brain is not sufficient. You have to know this, how it is actually embedded. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying, sometimes people say, well, you're saying the brain is not important. I'm not saying that. Here it says the brain is important. I know that. It would be ridiculous to say it's not important. Brain science is the biggest science in the history of mankind. So, yes, the brain is important, and I'm, I'm aware of that. But it's not the whole story. And I want to talk about the other part, which is equally important as the brain itself. Okay, now if you look at a current manufacturing environment, which we have on the left side, <clears throat> they're characterized by high predictability, that you know everything about the environment, you know what components, you know the, the arrangement of the components. So basically you can program Every, all the movements of these robots down to the last detail because everything is predictable. Now, if you go to the real world, the real world is totally, completely different. Now, uh, there is, it's characterized by low predictability, by high levels of uncertainty. So now, many of you, maybe not now, but in about half an hour, will start thinking about the drinks that you are going to have after the lecture, right? Now, you, are not, you cannot sit here and think about the individual steps that you will be taking as you go off to your favorite bar, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. You can't do that. You just go there and then you react to the environment, right? Because you can't know where the cars are. You don't know where other people will be. But in a manufacturing environment on the left, you can do exactly that. So these are completely different requirements for the robots, and now it's important to understand that the people who started this, you know, this, this idea of having robots share their living space with ours, which is characterized uh, uh, with this high level of uncertainty, they came from a manufacturing environment, and they took the methods that work extremely well on the left and put them on these robots and wanted to, these systems to function in the real world. And you can imagine that this doesn't work very well, and what the result is, I'll show you in the next slide. So this is applied to natural walking. So here's some natural walking, and here's some more natural walking. If you take the method, so these are people from uh, Honda, Asimo, that started the business about 25 years ago, and this is what you get. I mean, this is, I mean you know, it's cute, it's kind of cool, but it's not what you would call natural walking. I mean, it's sort of this typical sort of uh, robot-like uh, movement. Now, by contrast, that's because everything is controlled. I'll come back to that. Every, all the joints are controlled and pre-programmed. That's why you get this typical robot, you know, uh, walking pattern. Now, by contrast, if you look at this robot, it doesn't have sensors, it doesn't have motors, it doesn't have a computer or a microprocessor. It walks on an incline, but if you look at it, I'll play it for you again. It has a kind of almost freakish sense of naturalness to it, right? The way it walks, it's very strange. It has wide feet, it has the arms attached to the hips, and really looks strange, but it's kind of natural. Now, why might that be the case? Because I would hypothesize because in human walking there is also a passive component. So when you're walking, you're standing on this leg, on the left leg, the right leg is here, then in the next step the right leg has to come forward. Now what the brain does, it does not control in detail the joints but the body posture and then this leg is a bit like a pendulum and swings forward almost passively. So we actually let gravity work for us, right? And then the leg automatically comes forward, which is what we want in terms of control, but also because it's largely passive, we don't use up a lot of energy. So it's also very energy efficient. So we need low stiffness in the muscles when it's, the leg swings forward, 
and high stiffness on impact to cope with impact. So what the brain does, it dynamically changes the muscle tension, or more generally speaking, the brain dynamically changes the material characteristics of the body, depending on the situation. And so it's as if the brain were outsourcing this functionality of coping with impact to the muscle tendon system, to the material characteristics of the muscle tendon system, which is a much, much faster and much better, much easier way of controlling walking. Because there is no sensors, no motors, because there is no sensory motor loop, we talk about self-stabilization. Let's see. Yeah, and another point is that you know, even though the brain is not directly controlling the joints, the knee joint is doing exactly the right thing. So I think we have to get away from the idea that things, robots, machines, motors, only do the right thing if we control them directly. I mean, that's the Cartesian heritage that we have, right? We want to control, we want to control things. <laughs> and it's very hard to get away from that and sort of trust the idea of self-organization. But implicitly, the brain or we trust these processes of self-organization. I once had a Japanese professor in my laboratory and he was a hardcore control engineer. And he said, can I come to your laboratory? And said, well, of course, but what do you want to do in our laboratory? We, you know, we don't do the things you are doing. And then he said, yeah, I want to learn. And then he came and I showed him the video of the passive dynamic walker here. And said, you see, there is no control, but it walks very nicely. And then he looked at it and he was very unhappy. And then he said, but I want to control something, right? <laughs> But that's, you know, most people, you know, they really want to control. Anyhow, provocative question. Where is the memory for walking in this robot? Right? I mean, the, this robot has the ability to walk down an incline. Where is this ability stored? I mean, there's no, because there's no microprocessor, there's no memory. So it couldn't be stored in a particular location. Yes? It, well, in the process, and the process is determined by the you know, shape, by the, the, the length of the limbs, you know, the weight distribution, the frictional characteristics. So it's distributed throughout the entire organism. And this gives us a completely different perspective on memory. So memory, normally we think it's, you know, we put something in a particular location from where we retrieve it later on. It's distributed throughout the entire system. It's not in a particular location. I think most people, even researchers, often think of memory as uh, you know, being localized. It's changing a bit, though. So uh, we have a principle, a first or second principle here. There is a task distribution between the brain or the control, the body, which includes morphology, that is shape, materials, and the environment. So, it's not only a matter of control of up here. But as I said before, the brain is important. I'm not saying the brain is not important. Now, what's happening here is also something very interesting. Uh, in the traditional robotic sense, if you think about the manufacturing robots, you have the hardware of the robot, and then you have the program the control program for the robot. So there is a clear separation between the two systems. And if you look at this, when part of the control is already in the material properties, you know, the elasticity of the muscle tendon system, and in the morphology, in the passive dynamic walker, it's all in the morphology, this separation of the two systems breaks down so we can no longer use the principle of classical control theory for understanding these systems. And because biological systems are soft, you always have part of the functionality in the material and morphological uh, characteristics. And because now what used to be in the control or what you would think would need to be in the control is in the morphology. We talk about morphological computation. And I want to give you, an, to, to illustrate this point a bit further, I want to give you an example of a robot that we built a while ago. It's a very silly robot, very stupid robot, called Stumpy. And it only has two joints. It can basically do this, and it can do this. 
and then it has some springy materials on the feet. And if you, if you do it right, I mean, so basically what you can do, you can only manipulate these two joints. That's it. But oh, even though it only has two joints, it can move in about 20 completely distinct ways. And just to give you a flavor of what they can do, we built uh, a number of them, and then we made a choreography. And this should uh, give you an idea. Okay, I think, I think you're getting the idea. Now again here, you know, you saw in the behavior of the robots, they lifted off their feet like that. If you look at the control program, you don't see that. You have to understand the morphology, the weight distribution in the robot, the dynamics in order to understand this. From the control program, you cannot infer that. You have to know in what physical structure this uh, control program is embedded. Another example that I think is very nice is the robot frog that was developed at the University of Tokyo. That's with artificial muscles, pneumatic muscles. Now watch the slow motion. I mean, it looks very, very natural, right? And now you have this stamped oscillatory movement, stamped oscillation. Now this is not controlled. So if you have these artificial muscles, they are air muscles, they are made of rubbery material that has these elastic properties. So the functionality of coping with impact is outsourced to these material characteristics. The brain or the control here doesn't do anything for coping with impact. It's only the materials that do it for you. I think it's also a beautiful uh, illustration. And so I think we have to... Um, rethink the notion of control, because control always suggests that there is one instance which is the controller and the other instance which is the controlled. And in biological systems, biological systems simply don't work like that. <clears throat> so it's better to think in terms of orchestration. Now, I've been talking mostly about the motor side of things. S similar, similar points can be made uh, for the sensory side, that is the mor morphology of the sensors also give you a lot of information already. For example, if you look at insect eyes, you know, they have these many facets. And if you look at the arrangement, you see that it's non-homogeneous. And for certain types of tasks, you know, like obstacle avoidance, one morphology is good. And for other types of tasks, another morphology is good, for example following other insects. Log polar arrangement means, in our retina, we have a higher density of sensors in the center of the retina than on the per, uh, at the periphery. And that already helps us, for example, with, with uh, you know, we, we can detect movement in the periphery of the eye extremely well, and this is supported by the fact that we have this arrangement of the receptors in the retina and so on. So there we have that also. I don't have time to talk about that. Okay, what I would like to talk about now is something which is seemingly very removed from the field of cognition, which is materials. I already talked about materials. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the power of materials. And here is a fish, so we built some fish. It's a very stupid fish. It only has one joint, it can only wiggle its tail fin. And if you get the right materials for the tail fin, it actually looks, uh, it looks very natural. I mean, it can't be more primitive than this. You know, it's very simple, but get the right materials and then it will do it for you. <clears throat> now, octopus, we were involved in a project for building an artificial octopus, which is a typical soft creature, you know, everything is soft on the octopus, so without, you know, if we can build a, an, an octopus, we can do similar things, achieve these sensory motor abilities here, just, I mean, this is a continuous system, this is basically a system, well, let me just play a few of these, a system with potentially infinitely many degrees of freedom, 
So we can no longer use methods from classical control theory because they're always geared towards systems with finite degrees, finite number of degrees of freedom. And here you can just see a complete octopus sort of swimming underwater. Okay, this is the outcome of the project. Now, one of my favorite robots is this one. It was developed by Terry, uh, Barry Trimmer at Tufts University in Boston. Uh, it's an um, uh, artificial caterpillar. And caterpillars can move in two distinct ways. You know, they can sort of crawl like this, like a worm, or they can roll up, you know, like a tire of a car, and then they can roll very fast. That's when they have to move fast, they will do that. And so they did this here with actually with so-called shape memory alloys, which are these substances, these, these wires, you know, you heat them up, they contract, and they go back to the same shape when you cool them off. <clears throat> so here is the sort of worm-like movement. It's not so impressive, but now you have to look at the lower right corner. It's very fast. If you don't look there, you will miss it. And this is real time. And this is the slow motion here for it. But it's very fast, and this is because the elasticity of the materials is exploited here. This is not a process that is centrally controlled. So it's exploiting the material properties. Now, one of the most beautiful examples of the power of materials is the Jaeger Lipson coffee balloon gripper. Now, if you go to the supermarket and you buy a pack of ground coffee, then it's typically hard like a rock, right? That's because of the vacuum, right? If you open it, you know, the vacuum goes away and then it's really soft, you know, the ground coffee. And so what they did, they took a balloon, the blue thing there, they filled it with ground coffee, they added a vacuum pump, and then they have this balloon, you know, with the filled uh, coffee, and then with this, with this balloon, they move over the object and they lower the balloon on top of the object and because it's soft and deformable, it will automatically adapt to the shape of the object without control, just because the material is soft. And then they apply the vacuum and then the structure hardens and gives it a firm grip and then they can grasp with the same control. They can grasp almost any type of object with any shape, with the same control. So you don't need to know the shape of an object in order to grasp the object. So let me just show you here. Oops, sorry. Let me just show you a short video here. Light bulb, you know, a very small object. Shock absorber, bigger object. And now, the benchmark always with robots, can it do the raw egg? You know. ah, sure enough. And now just a demonstration that it is a raw egg. Yes. <laughs> right, so I think this is really amazing. Also, note that the control is really delegated completely to the periphery of the system, which makes it very powerful. Now, a similar phenomenon is happening when we grasp, I don't know, when you start thinking of you know, getting drinks after the lecture. And uh, you, you grasp a, a hard object like, like a glass, right? Now, what happens, first of all, you don't need to know the shape of the object. You can just apply a particular force, you can close your eyes, you don't need to know. And then the fingers will automatically adapt to the shape of the object. You just apply a particular force. What also happens is that the tissue on the fingertips is passively, and in the hand, is passively deformable. Right? So when you apply a force, you know, the, the, the tissue flattens out and adapts to the shape of the object. But that's not controlled from the brain, that's just the material properties of the tissue there. And then because the skin is, has always a certain level of humidity, it has the right frictional property that grasping or holding a glass like that is very easy. 
right? We don't even know the effort that's behind it. Now, if you think of thimbles, you know, when you sew with the needle, right? People used to have these thimbles. If you think of metal thimbles on all the fingers and try to grasp a straight glass with these thimbles, it's next to impossible, right? And then you realize what the materials that you have on your body actually do for you. I'll come back to this point, but I think it's really important. And it's a very similar principle that uh, is in operation with the Jaeger uh, Lipson coffee balloon gripper. Now, if you think about designing systems, if you put yourself into the position of a roboticist, now you have to deal with morphologies, with materials. So you have an expansion, explosion of your design space, right? And so you can you know, think about different morphologies. Previously, people just took a robot and they said, okay, now we have to program the robot. Well, that's, it's difficult, but comparatively easy. Now you have to think about morphologies. And morphology means also, you know, sensors, what types of sensors, how should I distribute the sensors on the organism? And, you know, what materials? And then it's important to understand the trade-offs. So when you put something, a functionality, you know, like coping with impact in walking into the morphology of the system, you gain efficiency, but you lose flexibility. Right, I mean, that's just the price you pay. There are always these trade-offs. Now, you can recover some of the lost flexibility if you have changeable material properties, for example, or changeable morphologies. So now you have to think about changeable morphologies as well. I mean, humans, we can change our morphology. You know, we can change the body posture. You know, we can change the muscle ten tension. We can change many things in, uh, in our morphology, in our material setup. And that gives us back some of the flexibility and we still have that higher level of efficiency. <clears throat> so we have to understand these, uh, these trade-offs and I mean this is not maybe not so important, I just try to sort of uh, put on a, on a linear scale on the left here for example an industrial robot a lot of control, so control is dominant. This is the Cartesian let's say the left side is the Cartesian side, right? And the more you get to the right you know, like here, the robot frog, for example, the octopus, and the coffee balloon gripper, they're more on the right. That's more where you have self-organization. You know, the shape of the balloon adapts automatically to the shape of the object, so that's self-organization. So the more on the right you are, uh, and the passive dynamic walker only has morphology, it doesn't have anything, but it doesn't have a lot of flexibility. And uh, on the right you then have molecules that spontaneously organize into uh, structures. Okay, so much now for the power of materials. I want to get back to these principles of intelligent behavior. Now, one of the most fundamental principles of, that holds for any intelligent system biological systems, but arti also artificial systems. There is an induction of patterns of sensory stimulation through the physical interaction with the environment. Okay, for example, when I'm walking here, like this, the environment travels across the visual field, okay? And that is because I am walking, because I am physically interacting with the environment. Also, I can feel the forces in the muscles, in the joints, I can feel the pressure on the feet. And that is because I am acting in the real world. So every action has as a consequence patterns of sensory stimulation. When I grasp this glass, I not only hold the glass in my hand, but I can also feel it. And that is the result of my physical interaction with the environment. You know, this is a pattern of sensory stimulation here. By the way, we have a very high density of sensors here on the fingers. So this is very rich sensory stimulation. And this is generated through my physical interaction with the real world. And these patterns of sensory stimulation that I'm generating in this way are, so to speak, the raw material for the brain to process and to learn something about the real world. I mean, it's very, a very, very fundamental principle. In addition, it can be shown that there are correlations in the different sensory modalities. What does that mean? So we take, for example, the, the visual modality. I can look at something, 
or the haptic or touch modality, I grasp it. Now, we can learn over time, we have to learn that, that by just looking at the glass, I already have an expectation of what it will feel like when I actually grasp it. Right? And these expectations are extremely important because they tell us about the success or failure of our actions. You know, the expected sensory stimulation. Also, we have, you know, kind of a, an expectation about he how heavy this is going to be, right? And there are the, these glasses on New Year's Eve. There are these glasses that are glued to the table, you know, and then you try to grasp, and then you can't lift the glass, and then you realize, only then you realize that you have the expectation. So whenever the expectations are fulfilled, you normally don't realize that you have the expectations, only when they're not fulfilled. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the essence of this is, we call this uh, information self-structuring or self-structuring of sensory data through the physical interaction. That's because self-structuring because through our own interactions, we actually generate these correlations, which then makes the information processing of the brain much easier because there is, we call, also call this information structure. And I think this is really a, a prerequisite for learning. And I think this is just... These ideas have been around for a long time. I mean, it goes all the way back to John Dewey in 1896. It's not a typo, it's not 1986, it's 1896. And when it's, it's very interesting, when you read John Dewey, 1896, you really think he's arguing against the computer metaphor of uh, human intelligence. And I just, just uh, for, the, for the fun of it, he says, we begin not with a sensory stimulus, so no, not, it's not input process, basically what he's saying, it's not input processing output, but we begin with, not with a sensory stimulus, but with the sensory motor coordination. In a certain sense, it is the movement which is primary and the sensation which is secondary, the movement of the body, head and eye muscles, determining the quality of what is experienced. In other words, the real beginning is with the act of seeing. It is looking, not a sensation of light. I mean, I think it's very revolutionary what he is actually saying. It's so contrary to what everybody was thinking. And actually, most people uh, are still thinking. Now, there is an interesting, important concept. I don't want to go into the details, but I think it's important to know about that. And that's called sensory motor contingencies. And what it means is basically when I perform an action, the sensory stimulation, we said that every action has as a result sensory stimulation. It's basically, it would be better to say, a change in sensory stimulation, right? And these changes in sensory stimulation are systematic and they are different for different sensory modalities. So when I perform a particular movement with a hand, the haptic sensory stimulation like that, or I do this, doesn't change very much. Whereas if I move my head like that, the visual sensory stimulation changes very much. So sensory motor contingencies are about these changes and that depends on the morphology, depends on the action and it depends on the environment. I mean, if I hold the glass like that, the sensory stimulation that I feel in the hand is very different from when I perform this action. So it not only depends on the object, but also on my action and of course where I have the sensors. I mean, normally I don't rub the glass against my back if I want to have some information about it, because the density of the sensors is much lower there. Okay, now, let me give you the story. I don't have much time left. Uh, how this all fits together. I think it all fits together in a beautiful picture. And I, it's really a silly example, but I think it illustrates the point. So if I stand here and I let my arms swing loosely like that, this is a movement that requires very little control. I mean, I just control the body posture, but the arm swings, you know, just like that. It requires very little energy because the arm muscles low stiffness, you know. If you look at the movement of the hand, it's actually a complex movement in 3D space. So, complex movement, but very simple control, very simple energy efficient control. Now, the, you, you could say that the arm, the joints, basically the elbow joint and the hand, they self-organize into a particular trajectory. Now you can say, okay, well, that's very nice, but what is it good for, right? Now, okay, the, the story, the way the, the story 
goes is like that. The reason this movement is easy to control is because of an evolutionary predisposition. We have a particular anatomy, we have particular tissue, muscle, muscles and tendons, and that will give it automatically this movement. A movement like that is much harder to control and requires much more energy, but a movement like that is very natural. Okay, now what, what, is, it, what is it good for? Imagine that the hand happens to encounter an object. Okay, now there is an evolutionary predisposition that the palm of the right hand is facing left. So the natural thing is to actually grasp the object, right? Then I hold the object in my hand, and at the same time, because we have a high density of touch sensors in the hand and on the fingertips, I induce rich patterns of sensory stimulation. Also, this is then the most natural movement that requires little control because of the biomechanical constraints. This movement would require much more control. So I do this. Well, this also brings the cup or the glass into the visual field, into the center of the visual field, and then I can see it, I can manipulate it, and then if you imagine, you know, this movement is very easy actually to control, and then I, I can drink from the glass, and so I get basically everything that really uh, very nicely fits together, and this is the, the basis for learning and also for forming what's called cross-modal associations. An object, concept of an object, is not never only visual, it's also haptic, you know, it's, it's proprioceptive, is what you can do with it, and so on. So this is just a, a cartoon, you know, showing these cross-modal, how these cross-modal associations are formed. And then the idea is, if you want to build, I said you want to build cognitive system, I thought, so on the first slide, building your own cognition, right? So the idea would be to have a developmental approach where you build cognition from these sensory motor processes. It's called a developmental approach. And then the question that comes up always is, well, but, you know, grasping sensory motor interaction. Will we ever get to something really interesting like high-level cognition, mathematics, language, and things like that? Well, there is what's called the Lake of Nunez hypothesis, and they have this very provocative, very nice book, uh, Where Mathematics Comes From, How the Embodied Mind Brings Mathematics into Being. And their hypothesis is that basically, even high, they say even highly abstract concepts such as transitivity numbers or limits are grounded in our embodiment. Mathematical concepts are constructed in a way that metaphorically speaking reflects our embodiment. Now, that was very provocative, because are there any mathematicians here? Okay, so we do have some mathematicians. Most mathematicians are actually Platonists, which means they start from the assumption that the mathematical truths are out there in the world, and we have to discover them. We discover the mathematical truths. In this approach, the math mathematical concepts are constructed. This is a constructivist view, and of course many mathematicians didn't like that at all. But at least I think it's a very, very interesting debate. Okay, now I don't have very much time left. I think he is already giving me these evil looks. Uh, <laughs> so I would like to talk about a recent project in soft robotics, uh, the uh, Roboy project that we actually developed on the one hand, as a research platform to study, on the one hand, the functioning of a muscle tendon system, but also the relation between movement and intelligence or cognition. You know, remember that I said every action has as a result patterns of sensory stimulation, and they are the raw material for the brain to learn something. So there's a very direct relation between the sensory motor processes and cognition. And so we, we built this also to study these uh, interactions and then also for studying human-robot interaction. And I think Roboy should also be an ambassador of a new generation of robots that share their living space with our own. Should be friendly, useful, fun to be with, and open source. Now, most, I mean, for most people, robots don't have a very good reputation. You know, we think of Terminator, now we think of war drones, and then we think of robots taking away people's jobs. So basically, it's a bad thing. And we sort of said, okay, we have to do something for the image of robotics. Let's have some, you know, robot that people actually like. And then we had a big exhibition uh, in, 
in uh, March last year. And uh, that was basically the uh, anniversary, 25th anniversary of our laboratory. And we built this robot specifically in a period of nine months for this, uh, for this uh, event. And we showed it in, in this exhibition. And this was like the week before. And then, uh, you know, these were like these lines. So these some of these people had to wait about three hours to get into the exhibition. And here is a row boy in the exhibition. I mean, it's just people just freak out. I mean, it's just unbelievable here also in, as part of a theater in the lower left corner. And then we had the media coverage that was, you know, really unbelievable. It was, it was like just everywhere, you know, what, what you can possibly imagine. And we're not quite sure, you know, why it was so attractive. Maybe the oversized head, maybe because it's tendon driven I will, I will uh, uh, say something about that. Now it's touring the world, and you know, it's been basically all over the world. And if we look at Roboy as a research platform, it's to study, I mean, most robots, what should be said is most robots have motors in the joints, right? But humans, we humans, we don't have motors in the joints, but we have muscles and tendons that are pulled over the joints, right? And so we try to sort of mimic this. If you look at this shoulder joint here, there are various tendons here, and he, these are the muscles, and these, this is basically the springs are for the elasticity of the muscles. And for the shoulder joint, I think there are eight muscles. There is a total of 48 muscles on the robot. Now, if you perform a movement like that, for us, very easy to do, right? But many muscles have to be coordinated and actuated to varying extent. Now, if I have 48 muscles on the robot and the shoulder joint has eight, is moved by eight muscles, which ones of these 48 muscles do I have to move by how much to achieve this particular movement? It's a very hard problem. The, the robot doesn't know, right? And we don't want to go there and program the robot and say, well, muscle 21, you have to actuate this much, muscle 42 this much, muscle 10 this much. No, it doesn't work. So we, use a we have to use a learning system. So we're actually up against a complexity barrier here. We have to use learning. We have no choice. And so we did something very primitive. We just move, I mean, it's known in robotics. We just move the arm, and then the robot can sense how the arm is actually moved, how, which muscles are moved to what extent, and then it can reproduce these movements. I mean, very roughly speaking. Uh, right. OK. So we want learning, not programming. I think that's something interesting. If you sponsor the project, you got your logo placed on the, on the uh, robot. And here you can see a bit of its movement. It's not very impressive yet, but we're working on, uh, on actually improving the whole thing. OK. Now, some people want to look at this as tensegrity structure, but that's maybe not so important. Now, Roboy touring the world, maybe just very briefly, it was in Beijing. It was also in, as, as a performer in a theater in Beijing. Now it's still on the flag there. You can't see it. It's a bit dark. And then we had it at the Science and Technology Museum in Shanghai. And we, the kids, they really went crazy about the whole thing. We couldn't, we couldn't drag them away anymore. And then we were in Washington, D.C. at the Swiss Embassy. And you know, it's just maybe not so important for this, for this talk, but this is the Swiss Embassy in Washington, D.C. Very nice view, it's about as big as a football field. And up there on the right, you can see the private residence of the Swiss ambassador. And each year, he hosts a party for 1,200 guests. And I was wondering about Swiss taxpayers' money, but that, that's on the side. And here, this, this is Roboy at the Swiss embassy. There, this is Roboy at TEDx in Zurich. And maybe I can show you a bit of its facial expression. Hey, listen. I want to show you how I can feel. I oh, can, I can be feel. happy. <laughs> I can be shy. <laughs> I can be surprised. Ooh. <laughs> I can be angry. I 
Why can't blink with my eye? I can be tired and go to sleep. Okay. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you very much, Roboy. Okay, now we can maybe talk a little bit about the future. So this is, you know, maybe Roboy doing whatever we want. We don't need self-driving cars anymore. There is an interesting development. So do I still have a couple of minutes? Huh? Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> so just to tell you what people are thinking about now in robotics. One is a recent trend is called cloud robotics and the inspiration, I don't know who has seen the movie Matrix? Ah, most, right? And so there's, I think it's a very interesting scene. I need a helicopter pilot program, right? So the inspiration is basically Not this. Not yet. Can you fly the thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Okay. So, <laughs> right. You can do that with Chinese, you know, basically. Uh, can you speak Chinese? Uh, not yet, you know, so basically. And so that's, that's a bit the idea of cloud robotics. Um, there's actually a Dutch, was a Dutch European uh, program, uh, Robo Earth, which is basically a world wide web. I think this, this is an interesting idea, a world wide web for robots. So basically they can connect to the cloud. And in contrast to humans, I mean, before you saw the human, you know, downloading to, to whom a, a program was downloaded for helicopter flying. With robots, you can actually do that. They can directly connect to the internet and download programs. I mean, there's, you have to think about embodiment, though. But it's basically, uh, uh, the idea is that robots are connected. They load up, they acquire some skills through learning. They load up their skills to the cloud. And then all the other robots that are also connected can benefit from the experience of other robots. And then you can imagine when all these robots learn different things, you know, there's an explosion of, of this know-how in the cloud. That was basically the idea of the robo Earth. And then there's some stuff. I like this one, uh, assembling uh, IKEA furniture. I like this robot. So, <laughs> Well, anyhow, so there are many, many of these robots, telepresence robots in hospital. This is a new experiment in uh, Switzerland where uh, uh, children who are at the hospital for a long time can connect through an avatar, in this case an hour robot, to uh, uh, their uh, class. I mean, we, we always, let me, let me just skip through this and come to the end. I just wanted to give you sort of this basic idea. It doesn't work very well yet, but I think it's a fascinating idea to, uh, to think about. So we have in summary, these principles of embodied intelligence, you know, the physical embedding, design for emergence, and then the cooperation of brain-body environment. And this, the last one is very important. E every action has a consequence in terms of sensory stimulation. Central role of materials that I tried to show. We need a new notion of control. You know, we don't have a clear separation between control and control. So it's not Cartesian, right? And we need to understand the design space. Now, the very last thing, it, it will take me only one minute, <laughs> is there is, I, I don't know, who has uh, read the book uh, Confessions of a Taoist on Wall Street by David Payne? Used to be a cult, sort of a cult book. Anyhow, this is from the beginning of the book. So there is a Chinese uh, 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 mother and an American fighter pilot. So Sunni is the son, uh, son of them. Then his father returns to the US and his mother dies at birth. And then he goes into a monastery and Wu is the, the chef, the cook. And one of the t chores they had was carrying water from the river up to the monastery. And when they arrived up there, the little boy's buckets were always empty and the chef's uh, buckets were always full. And here's the conversation. I think this characterizes very much what I was saying now. It was true. Sunni says, by some extraordinary luck or skill, Wu, the chef, 
never seemed to lose a drop, though he hurried along the treacherous stair at twice my pace. I tried to cut my losses by moving slowly, plodding my course in advance, and picking each foot's rest with deliberate care. I don't understand it, I confess to him. You must know some kind of trick. Explain your method. You haven't yet caught on. It's precisely this excessive method that confounds you, leaves the buckets nearly empty. I don't understand it, I confess to him. You must know... Oh, here, uh, I read this twice. How do I do it? Then he said, I close my eyes and I think of nothing. My mind is somewhere else. My legs find their way without me, even over the most uneven ground. How, I can how can I tell you how I do it? I can't even remember myself. And this is the illustration by uh, Shuni Vazava, which I think uh, makes the point very nicely. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Pryor. If there are people who have uh, another meeting, uh, they, it's maybe a good uh, moment to, to, uh, to leave. And otherwise, we go to uh, uh, the question session. So I think there's an early question here already. Well, thank you very much. I mean, as I told you over dinner, I'm completely sympathetic to the embodied embedded approach. So this is not in any way meant as a criticism to the general approach. But going back to walking, right, which was your starting point. Also over dinner, I was talking to some people over dinner, and they pointed out to me that there are different styles of walking. So if it was only a matter of the materials and the physical constitution, we would perhaps, you know, those of us with the same or similar constitutions would walk in the same way. And yet a rapper walks in a certain way. And say a dancer, a female dancer walks in a different way. And I think there are also cultural variations uh, you know, in different countries in how walking takes place. So I just want to point out that maybe, although I completely agree with you, it's not all in the brain. It's not all centralized. But there is an aspect that cannot be reduced to the purely physical constitution of the organism and there's some cultural dimension to walking that I think is worth exploring. Yeah, okay. I think it's a very good point. I think this cultural dimension, I agree, this is a cultural dimension, but ultimately even a cultural dimension has to be mapped down onto the physiology of the organism in order to have an effect on the behavior. Right. You can call that culture, but you don't explain very much when you call it, just call that culture. You want to know how it actually works. And here is a hypothesis of how it might actually work. So, I, you know, I, I stressed a few times that the brain is not controlling the joints directly. But what it is controlling is some higher level parameters. For example, body posture. Now, depending on body posture and muscle, particular muscle tendon, makes it easy for you to perform certain types of movements. And depending on your body posture, your style of walking will be different. But it only implies that the brain will need to manipulate relatively few parameters, and then it can leave the rest of the walking to the local dynamics and doesn't have to really control that. And that's very important. If you take a dancer, it's much, to, you know, a look at break dancing or what, what have you, it's much, much too fast to be centrally controlled by the brain. So it has to be this sort of, let's say, controlling global parameters and then exploiting the, the local dynamics. And what the brain does, it sort of changes the global dynamics such that the local dynamics and functions. And I think that's, you know, relatively vague, but I think that that could be sort of a way of showing what the role of the brain is and how it cooperates with the body. It's not controlling the body, it's cooperating with the body. Hi, it's this. <clears throat> um, I, have, I have a question um, about, uh, oh, a little bit closer. I, yeah. I have a question about um, the uh, integration with this development of, of embodiment with, with something like cybernetics or with uh, robotics that are designed to replace, say, for example, limbs in people who have been injured. Um, is there any way of, of um, using the, the data that you receive from uh, people who have artificial legs, for instance, to, and, and emulating those, uh, that movement or that process uh, and bringing it back forth to, to just strict mechanical robots in itself, um, or, or what's what the link between these two uh, fields might be for, for the embodiment of, of, uh, 
uh, yes. for this embodiment principle that you've uh, referred to? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, we, we have been working mostly so far on upper limb prosthetics, like hand prosthetics. And in hand, hand prosthetics, the, I mean, there are, or in prosthetics in general, there are two fundamental questions. One question is, how does the prosthesis know what you want the prosthesis to do? You know, how does my artificial hand know that I want to grasp this glass, right? So that's one area, it's a whole research area. And the other one is, and that's maybe more related to your question, is once the, the prosthesis has grasped the glass, we, I, you know, I said several times, we can feel it. And that's very, very important. And how can we now in a prosthesis, even if we have sensors in the prosthesis, how can we convey this sensory stimulation back to the person such that the person actually gets the impression that it can actually, or she can actually feel the glass in the hand. So how do I feed that back? But that's for the, for the prosthetics domain, and that's a very difficult, very difficult question. I mean, we did some experiments. You know, what, one, of, one of the problems is that you, you, of course, in order to know for the prosthesis what, sh what it should do, you need sensors. You know, you can use uh, like uh, EMG sensors, uh, uh, you know, electrodes that you put on the skin that tell you something about the intentions of the person. And you can measure these currents uh, or uh, voltages, these very small voltages, even if the person doesn't have a hand anymore. So these voltages are still there. They're different, but they're still there. So you can use these sensors. That's one thing. We also have been working with acceleration sensors because with the gesture, once you know the gesture, you, that gives you a lot of information about what the person wants to do with it. Now, you want to give the feedback, you want to provide the feedback now from the sensors, if, uh, assuming that you have touch sensors in the prosthesis. You can't give it back to the same arm because that will interfere with the electrodes, with the sensing. And so you have to give, you know, feed it back somewhere else. But even if you, let's say, have an electromechanical stimulation for this, after a few weeks of training, the people say that they can actually feel the glass in the hand. So we call this sensory substitution. So basically, this sensing is successively substituted. I mean, these are just the first traces, but that's basically the direction in which uh, we want to go and which I think is a very interesting one. Now, you were asking also how that could be translated to uh, robotics or... I mean, this prosthesis, building the, the prosthesis, is something that comes from robotics. So we basically use our know-how from robotics to actually, for example, the tendon-driven system thing. And that's very important. I mean, one of the advantages of tendon-driven systems, and maybe one of the reasons why humans are largely tendon-driven, is that you can have the motors on the torso, you don't have the motors on the arm, then you can have a higher payload. I mean, if you have motors in the joints, that's always a lot of weight in the arm, right? For an industrial robot, it doesn't matter. You know, you have arbitrary power, but we have to be very, in mobile robotics, you have to very, be very power efficient. And so maybe tendon-driven systems is a good thing. And the tendon-driven solutions we, we have from robotics, and we apply this then to the prosthetic hand. So it's more like we, we exploit robotic technology for prosthetics. Other questions? When can I buy an artificial night that brings me my coffee and brings me my journal under 4,000 euros? Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it depends on, for example, what, what this, you know, whether you want to have a really multifunctional robot that can do many different things, or whether uh, you want just a specialized thing. I mean, partially you can view a coffee machine as a kind of, you know, very simple robot that will just, you push the button, you get the coffee. You don't have to grind it, you have, don't have to fill in the water, right? I really, I really think of sitting in 
my chair. I've been <coughs> thinking of sitting on a chair and say, bring me a cup of coffee, and it goes to my machine, picks it up, or bring my journal, go to the front door and pick up my journals. That kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Especially when I'm disabled. In yeah, yeah. years, I will be disabled, and I like a helper like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, what is already, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's at a commercialized stage, but at the prototype stage, this is already available. I mean, it's, and these are typically robots on wheels. You know, they're not walking robots, they're on wheels, but who cares? I mean, you know, they, they, uh, they fulfill the job, and that's, that's available. I mean, they can do that, they can go to the refrigerator, but, it, you know, it's, it, it, in terms of, let's say, adaptability or flexibility, something changes slightly in the environment, and, you know, a finger gets stuck. I mean, once, once I've seen a demonstration of, of a, a robot that was filling in dishes into... Oh no, it, it would have to remove dishes from a dishwasher. And then it was wanted to open the dishwasher, <laughs> and then the hand, the fingers of the hand somehow got stuck in the handle of the dishwasher, <laughs> and then it was pulling harder and couldn't, so it started vibrating, and then it made puff and smoke came out of the shoulder, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> it's you know, it's things like I, I think. You know, this, what, what, you are, what you are suggesting exists already at the prototype stage, and, you know, but maybe it's going to be... I mean, there are you know, various scenarios. One is that you have really have a multifunctional robot, and the other scenario is that you have many specialized machines. Now, the point is, you know, we as human beings, we can do very many different things. You know, really many things. But if you think about it, we can do nothing really well. For every sort of individual task, or for most individual tasks, there is a machine that can do it better, faster, more precisely, more cheaply, and without tiring. Right? For specialized, isolated tasks. Now, the question is whether you want to reproduce something that can do everything just as poorly as we can, or whether you prefer to have to exploit the technology and say, okay, I want to exploit the technology and build specialized machines and exploit what we can do there. I think the, 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 uh, the jury is still out on which scenario it will actually be. I really think it might actually be the specialized machines. Because, you know, if you look at the price, you know, sometimes people ask, well, what, what did Roboy cost? And Roboy can't do very much. You know, it's not. It couldn't do what you would like a robot to do. You know, it costs, at, you know, I would say on the order of five to six hundred thousand euros. I mean, this is the first prototype, and it's very fragile. You know, needs to be repaired frequently, and so it's really questionable whether this is a commercially viable scenario or whether it's not the specialized machine. You have the vacuum cleaners, you have the coffee machine, you have a okay. conveyor belt, or I don't know what. It's open. Okay. Thank you. With, so, with these words, I think we have uh, reached the nice uh, uh, end of this uh, of this uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay.